Father, we thank you for your presence here. We thank you, Lord, for your, your majesty, your righteousness in the house today. Thank you that you have poured out on us the Holy Spirit. Father, we cannot even begin to understand the gift that you've given to us. But our hearts are grateful. And we love you, Lord. We give you honor and glory today. Father, our desire is to accomplish what you put us here to do, not only in the moment we're in, but in the season and the time we're in. So we thank you, Father, for empowering us to accomplish that which is on your heart. We give you glory in the name of Yeshua. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. I, um, I have a message. I really do. <laughs> and uh, the title of the message is Destroying Strongholds. And uh, I, think, I think this is one of those that I know is going to be a two-parter, so we're not going to get through it all today because uh, there's more. Stay tuned, right? I mean, the church, the church loves to delve into the, the, the epic battles, you know, good versus evil. The War in the Heavenlies, Clash of the Titans, all those Hollywood titles that we love to think about. Uh, and, yet, and yet there's a, um, a, a battle that the church tries to pretend doesn't exist. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And that's the battle in your soul. Um, the, the, this scripture uh, that I'm going to share is often referred to when it comes to spiritual warfare. But that's not what it's written there for, so I'll talk about that. I think that um, the neat thing about the Word of God is that um, it can talk to us on multiple levels at once, and many people can hear a different message. In fact, one of the things about a, a, a person who's sharing life from the Word of God, any of the fivefold ministries, anybody who's, who's sharing up here, um, <clears throat> you might be hearing something else. Don't think it's strange that you can't remember what the pastor says. If you have been given life from the Holy Spirit and he's giving you revelation. Now, if you're ignoring the pastor and you're on Facebook or reading your texts, then yeah, you should feel guilty. But the thing about the, the life that comes forth from the Word of God is such that it ignites in you the thing that God has for you, the purpose that God's working in you, so that um, as, as the Word of God is being shared, it's yes, it's your responsibility to listen and to pay attention, take copious notes, and watch the video 300 times over. I'm kidding, but now the videos are working. I want to thank Quig and, and Bob and everybody who was involved in repairing this. We had multiple failures at once, catastrophic technological failures. Everything was falling apart, and, uh, and I was like, I told, Quig called me yesterday and said, I have good news, everything's working. And uh, so now there's a you're, the high bar, the bar is set there, Quig, for everything to work, right? And I said, I wish it was the fact that I told the enemy, don't make me come down there. But I didn't say that, so I can't take credit for it. But I know that they worked hard to restore the issues and set things right and get things working. And, and so uh, we appreciate that. It's nice when technology works, isn't it? No matter what we're doing, it's nice when it actually does what it's supposed to. Uh, I was going somewhere with that, but let's read our scripture. The, um, this message is about strongholds, and um, let's start in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. Strongholds make you wage war according to the flesh. I'm going to do what I usually do. I'm going to comment as we go through this and uh, share a little bit, but... Verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. 
And that word strongholds is this. It's pervasive reasonings that serve to reinforce one's own opinion. It has nothing to do with demonic activity. It says uh, persuasive reasonings that serve to reinforce one's own opinion. Okay, those are the strongholds we're talking about. We destroy arguments. And that, the Greek definition of that is subtle reasonings that become like fortresses. It's up here. The battle's in the mind. Uh, and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive, the mind, the thoughts. Um, and that word captive actually means to bring your thoughts under control. The next one, to obey Christ. This is an interesting, the literal translation of that is to hear under the anointed. To obey Christ in this passage means to hear underneath the anointing, right? And that's, uh, that, I mean, you can dwell on that for a while. And verse 6, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Now, Paul was writing to, to the Corinthian church because they had begun to believe some things that weren't true. Now, he was prepared to deal with those who had been preaching this false gospel, these false teachers. But first, the church had to be obedient. And this is, this is one of the keys to coming out of strongholds is obedience. And believe me, we'll talk about that later. But I want to I share that this passage, obviously, we know has been used a lot. When you look up spiritual warfare verses, this one's probably at the top of the list. But the, the book of... Uh, Second Corinthians is is not about spiritual warfare. It's about dealing with the heart of the individual. Paul was writing to the church because they were starting to believe things that weren't true. And so there was a, a battle for the mind of this church. It was an active church. They moved in gifts and callings. They had powerful ministry. But they were starting to move into error. And what Paul had to do was to, to, to set down the law and say, I'm, you know, the thing I gave you from the beginning is truth. Anybody who comes after me and shares another gospel is, is bringing you a falsehood. And they were beginning to believe those, those arguments. A lot of preaching happened without the power. And he, 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 he chose not to preach with his persuasive words. He chose to preach using the power of the gospel, the power of the Holy Spirit. And yet there were people coming into the church who were preaching with persuasive words and they were beginning to stir people up against the truth of the gospel, the truth of the Holy Spirit, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So they, you had to bring your thoughts captive to under the anointing. The, the enemy always attacks the anointing. He's the spirit of the antichrist, anti-anointing. It doesn't say the spirit of anti-Yeshua, anti-Jesus. It's a spirit of anti-anointing, antichrist. Anyway, so the war is a conflict in your soul. The mind is a battleground. The Corinthian church was beginning to accept all these false teachings, like we said, and no church is exempt from this. We all have to be on guard for things like this that happen. We need to be ready to say to someone who comes in and shares something that's not scriptural, so wait a minute, that, that's not in the word, I can't find it, where, where is that, and challenge. Challenge the word sometimes. If you have to challenge it and discuss why, reason back and forth, why things are scriptural and why things are not scriptural. Um, there are some things in the, that we implement that are not in the Bible. Plexiglass pulpits are not in the Bible. You know, youth ministry, children's ministry is not in the, not in the word of God. But they're practical things that we've used to implement the kingdom of God. So within reason, I'm saying, obviously. But the, um, the ministry of the Holy Spirit was being opposed by believers who had arguments that they wanted to assess. They wanted to make a fortress out of what they believed. And they were spreading the word in the Corinthian church that this is true and that gospel that you've heard before is true, but mine is also true. And Romans 12, 2 says, um, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is what they were going through. They were going through the renewing of their mind because that's where the battle was. The battle is in the mind. And so um, I guess defining strongholds will be good. So what are strongholds? So in light of the, uh, the context of this passage and other scriptures that, that I've studied, I can't share them all right now because that would take the rest of our day. 
But the uh, strongholds are this, the following. I've got five, I think it's five points of what a stronghold is. Um, strongholds are destructive attitudes or opinions or harmful thought patterns that you don't know you have until they're exposed. They cannot be rebuked or cast out because they're not demonic. They're soulish. Um, they can only be pulled down. And that's between you and the Holy Spirit to pull them down. This is not because, um, you know, they're demonic. They're entrenched in your soul, involving your mind, your will, your emotions. And they hinder your spiritual growth, your healing, your intimacy with God. Strongholds grieve the Holy Spirit because they keep you from entering into the renewing of your mind that is so necessary to be transformed. Otherwise, you're already conformed to the image of this world. Strongholds hinder our spiritual discernment. They hinder seeing or hearing in the spirit. Because the soul rises up and asserts its dominance against that still small voice of the Holy Spirit. Number two, strongholds are mindsets that we've developed because of lies we've believed. Um, we may be unaware of it. We may not know that we believe these things that are untrue. And the Holy Spirit will reveal them as we begin to move closer to the to the our relationship with the Lord. And so the um, they're based on something that we believe that's not that's not actually true. Um, how often have you believed something for years that you found out wasn't actually the case? Right? We've all we've all found something that have has uh, been like a, a wake up call to us. Um, there's a famous quote by Mark Twain. He said this, A lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. <laughs> and now with the Internet, it can go all the way around five times before the, yeah, the truth is put on its shoes. So, you know, a story from my own childhood. I know this is a serious topic, but a little bit of levity is, is good. My, my own trauma um, as a child was severe because of a truth that I... I believed, I heard people say this, and I believed it, um, and I, it, it traumatized me. And so the, have you ever heard it said that you should wait an hour after you eat before you go swimming, right? We all grew up. I spent hours sitting by the pool, waiting to go back in the water. I was traumatized. Anyway, please don't tell my mom I shared this, because... She would feel bad now. But all because, it, and that's not really true. That's not a, a physiological fact. You know, it's wise to not eat while you're in the pool, but I guess that's a different topic. <laughs> so, um, like I said, don't tell my mom. Strongholds, number three. Strongholds become filters through which we unknowingly view the world. Like walking into a building wearing dark sunglasses. You walk in, and to you, it's like, oh, it's dark in here. Can somebody turn on some lights? Everyone else knows that you're wearing sunglasses, but you're looking through a filter that you, you, you've forgotten they're on. I've done that myself. How many of you have done that? Or you walk around with your glasses on your head, and you're like, where are my glasses? You know? So we've all done that, okay? Um, they, uh, it's funny. Perception often becomes reality. What you perceive often becomes that reality that you, you dwell in. This is why we want to be aware of the the superior reality of the kingdom. Because if we're walking in the inferior reality of this world, conformed to the image of this world, then we are not focusing on the superior reality of God's presence, God's kingdom. And you can't make things that are on earth like they are in heaven if you don't have your eyes on that reality. Um, Paul said in Ephesians 4, he said, those people who think like this are darkened in their understanding. It would have been a good thing for me to bring, bring my sunglasses in. So you're looking through the dark lenses of a sunglasses because you're looking through that filter that you've, you don't even know is there. And Paul says those people are darkened in their understanding, meaning they don't have the light of the Holy Spirit filling up their understanding, their perception. All right. Number four, strongholds are an expression of unbelief and fear. A stronghold takes effect when you believe um, when, you, when you are acting in fear when you're walking in, the, in a fear of something 
Fear and faith, I've often said this, are, are, are very similar in the fact that they both expect something. Fear expects something bad to happen. Faith expects something good to happen. There's a, there's a dynamic that they both work on that same principle. So when you're expecting something bad to happen, um, then you're already prepared to walk in the fear and the unbelief that is there. So when these thoughts become established as truth, they become habits, they become opinions, they become traditions that we walk in without knowing that the basis of the whole thing is, is not true, not as true as we'd like or not, not true enough that we need to put that much effort into it. Yeah, and these things often contradict the heart of the Father. They damage your relationships, they damage your environment you're in, whether it's home, work, church, uh, living with a stronghold and not knowing it. Especially if the Lord has revealed it to you, living with that stronghold is, is damaging to your life. And um, that brings us to number five. Strongholds spread like cancer. A stronghold begins as a seed of unbelief or doubt in your mind or fear. In the solitude of your own mind. But will grow when exposed to the atmosphere of agreement. How, how often do you think people have an idea in their mind that doesn't really affect them too much, but then they go online and they find other people who have the same issue? You can find, I mean, nowadays with the Internet, you can find agreement about any topic you want. You search it, it's there. If it's not there, AI will make it up for you, and it will be there, and you'll be suffering from something you didn't know existed. That's the way the Internet is sometimes, is that... You know, it gives a name to something, then then you're like, "Wow, I have bingo." You know, and and before you you were gonna fight it, and you were gonna resist it because it seemed unusual, but now you know that 800,000 other people have this issue, so it's okay. It's okay not to be not to be, you know, okay. But that's not true. God makes us better than okay. So I mean, think about the the influencers on YouTube. And that's what they're called, influencers. Uh, Groupthink, the herd mentality, peer pressure, it's all accentuated with the social influence. And what strongholds need is people to agree with them in order for that stronghold to grow. And then you get a mob, basically, who can do pretty much anything that an individual person might not do. I think Men in Black said it, said it best. I can't remember the quote exactly, but Will Smith said, aren't people smart? And uh, his, his mentor said, a person is smart. A crowd is stupid, arrogant, ignorant, and will do anything they're told. Right? So it's that group thing that leads us often as a church to make decisions and do things that might not be the best. I'm not going to worry about the world. The world will do what they're going to do, right? Sinners will sin. My job is to bring truth to the church and, and see us grow as much as we can. Hallelujah. Okay. Um, those five, five characteristics of a stronghold. So now we're going to move right into how to discern a stronghold. How to tell if you got this strange bug. Okay. Uh, number one. Do you find yourself unable to escape harmful or destructive cycles? Life cycles. That you keep getting into the same problem or you keep getting into the same relationships, or you keep getting into financial trouble the same way over and over. That's evidence of a stronghold. They themselves are not the actual stronghold because there's often wisdom that can overcome these things. Counsel, wisdom, and, and, and discipline can overcome a lot of these things. But it's, a, it's evidence of a stronghold in something you believe that's not right. Uh, I'm not going to give examples because there's, I mean, most of you are probably already thinking of something that can fill the gap, you know, the, the, the blank in there. Um, this is often accompanied by an ignorance about why the cycle is happening. Have you ever found yourself saying, I, I don't know why this is happening to me and I can't stop it? I mean, I think we've all been in a situation like that where we can, we can think about something we've going, going through or gone through that, that why is it happening to me? And, and the evidence can lead you to believe that there's something wrong with you, something wrong with the way you're living. But what, what is happening is something that I'm going to talk about the process that's happening. And God is so gracious because he, 
he takes us through a process that brings us into refinement instead of failure. And that's the, that's where all these are going. So give me a second here. Okay, this, uh, do you find yourself unable to escape harmful or destructive cycles? That's number one. Um, like I said, that's evidence that you are believing something that's not true. You're believing a lie. Number two. And this one is probably the clearest indication that you're struggling with a stronghold. Do you get offended? And there was silence in the church. Becoming offended cannot happen without a stronghold in your life. We've all been there. Okay? And we're all dealing with things that, that well... And I'm, like I said, I'm not going to give examples because your, your mind's already taking you there. Those of you who know what I'm talking about, know what I'm talking about. Okay? Um, there would be no offense without a stronghold. And to the degree that you're experiencing an emotion, usually anger, that's the degree that the emotion, that the stronghold has taken hold. Okay? I know this is a tough word, but I think... I've got to touch on some things that we all deal with that there is hope in overcoming. I'm not going to lead you to the end of the tunnel and say, well, sorry, you're out of luck. When we get to the end of this message, there's going to be a, a pathway to, to wholeness, a, a, um, a method and a person to help us through this. And it, it comes in, in ways that you might not have thought of. In fact, if you haven't thought of it, this is a good way to, to escape the strongholds that you're in. So simple sometimes. Um, number three, do you perceive yourself as a victim and other people are to blame for your problems, for your conditions? You know? Okay? Number four, do you assert that you have the right to feel the way you feel? I have a right to be angry. I have a right to be right. Darn it. Sometimes you have to give up your right to be right and let go of these things that are harmful to you. Um, do you have the right to be fearful? Do you have the right to be envious? Do you have the right to be angry? Do you have the right to be resentful? I think it's, yeah, it's actually F-E-A-R. Fear, envy, anger, resentment spells out fear. Never make a decision when you're in any of those states because... You're only making a decision based on the bondage that you're in, not on the freedom that is coming to you, all right? Don't make a decision because of pressure or, or anger or resentment. Strongholds prefer to remain hidden, and if we don't invite the Lord to, to, to remove them, because you can't cast out a stronghold, you can't cast out your own soul. But you can ask the Holy Spirit to walk with you through this and, and show you what you're in the middle of. Because when you enter into that cycle of success and failure, success, failure, success, failure, it's a, there's a reason that this is happening to you. And we used to call it go ringing around the mountain again. Or, you know, there's cycles. Life is filled with cycles. And, um, but... We know these are ungodly, destructive beliefs that are wrong, but we've learned to hide them so well that it's almost like they don't exist. We've worked around them for so long that we've disguised them enough that we're okay. It's the new normal. I can deal with that. But the uh, strongholds keep you from cooperating with the presence of God. They will obstruct your way into the miraculous. They'll, re they'll restrict your faith. They're only removed by divine intervention from the Holy Spirit after you repent and renounce that behavior and ask him to remove them. It's all very simple. It's not complicated. It takes a little bit of humility to say, Lord, I'm suffering from something. I don't know what it is, but I, I've got to renounce this behavior. As we grow closer to the Lord and begin to desire greater revelation about the kingdom, God must reveal these mindsets in us that hold back our relationship with him. As the Father draws us closer to Him, we find that there's less things of this world that we can carry into the presence. You know, I've shared about things that the Lord told me I, I, that I used to do. I, you know, I love to watch shoot 'em up movies I, I shared here, you know. 
you know, Chuck Norris is great, and all these guys are, are great, you know, I'm not going to say idols, but all of us have a quote we can think of, you know, I'll be back, you know, uh, from movies we've seen that were, that were great, and, and the Lord told me one time, he says, you can't bring that into my presence, and I was like, ooh, I, I, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a struggle not to, because he filters these things out of you, and then until so you go back to an old movie or an old song from your youth, and you're like, oh, this is such a good song, and you're listening to the words, and you're like, no, not really. Actually, it's kind of stupid, right? We've, we've been there. So you know that, that God refines you, and that process of refining is a cycle. He'll bring you back around again, and he'll pick up something else that you need to get rid of because he wants to draw you closer to his presence. He wants to bring you into the Holy of Holies, like the tabernacle. Where you walk into the tabernacle, there were stations that you had to go through to become cleansed. You couldn't just walk in the way you were, into the Holy of Holies. You had to follow a procedure. And not that the answer is in a procedure or in rules or traditions. We don't, we don't want that. But the, answer, the, the way to approach the Lord is to do it on His terms. And as He refines you and brings you out of these bondages that you're in, you find yourself being able to step into the Lord's presence in a moment. Whereas before, it took weeks of, of struggling with these things in your past that you, that you couldn't get rid of. But when you're free of those things, you find yourself in, a, in the blink of an eye or in a moment, you, you're, you drop from this sensation in your head to your heart, and you're like, yes. Anybody, anybody know what I'm talking about? Every, like someone says, all right, let's pray. You know, and, and I go from here to here, like boom, okay, oh, I'm there. And, and it, it takes a while to get to that point where you can overcome all the crap that's been thrown at you over the years. But when you let the Lord bring you through that cycle of, cycle of refining, I call it, then it becomes so much easier. Oh, look at that. We're in the cycle of refining. So what's that process look like? So like a roller coaster effect. How many of you had a roller coaster relationship with the Lord sometimes? You know? You're... One day, you, he, he shares this wonderful truth with you, and you're like, wow, this is so cool. And you're, you're sharing it with everybody. And the next day, you say something totally carnal, totally foolish. I know none of you have done that, but I have, okay? And I'm not going to share it because we're on YouTube. So, but I, you know, one day, your life is wonderful, and the next day, your life is not so wonderful. One day you're getting these revelations from the Lord, and the next day these sins that you thought were gone are coming to the surface. Oh, God loves to stir the stew. No, good stuff. He wants all the good stuff stirred up. But the, um, oh, let me see if I can get back in somewhere into my notes here. Hallelujah. You know, one step forward, two steps back. Success, failure, success, failure. Because... There's a pro and, and think about it this way. You're not, if you change the way you think about it, it makes a huge difference. Because you're thinking, oh, I'm really doing great. Oh, I'm doing terrible. But God says you're not going from success to failure. What you're doing is from refinement to refinement. He's bringing you, he's refining you through the process. He's bringing you around the cycle again because he wants to bring you closer to his, into his presence. And he says, I love you so much. But this one thing I have to get rid of. And then a while later he says, I just love you. But there's this one thing we have to, we have to get rid of. We all walk into the presence of God with baggage, right? We all have some sort of baggage. It's the human condition. You can't avoid it. But you can renounce and repent of those things. Change the way you think about them. And then walk into his presence in a new and, and invigorous, invigorating way. Hallelujah. Okay, the one thing the Lord told me that led me, that I've seen that's been true very, very often, he says, I reveal the kingdom in levels and layers. And I wrote that in my journal, and I'm like, this is great, and, uh, but what does it mean? And he'll often show me something, and he'll say, this is that, which I spoke of. This is that thing that I, I shared earlier, and I'm like, that's so cool. Like, like uh, Peter, when he was at the, at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, he said, this is that that Joel spoke of, when the Holy Spirit would be poured out on all flesh. And the Lord's done that with me to the point where I'm like, okay, um, 
I've seen it happen over and over. And when he reveals a layer or a level of something, with every level of walking into the Lord's presence, there's a layer of something he wants to remove. He wants to cleanse. He wants to purify. He wants to bring you into a, that relationship with him where as soon as you see it, it, you cringe at what you're bringing with you. And you say, Lord, I, you know, but even before he hints about it, you see it, and he's already there ready to take that thing away and, and, and throw it away and put it under the blood of, blood of Yeshua because that's the, the goodness of our Father is that he wants us to walk with him through all these things that we're going through, and he will accompany us. Hallelujah. So you cannot proceed far in your relationship with the Lord without encountering this cycle of refining. I don't know what else to call it. For lack of a better term, that's my name. In doing this, he reveals strongholds in your mind or your will, your emotions, or a combination of all three. But they're all usually soulish, soulish uh, strongholds that do not serve his purpose in your life or produce fruit. It's not always pretty when he purifies us. How many of you seen rotten fruit? You know, the other night I came down and there's a peach in a bowl. And I'm like, oh, peach, I love peaches. And I took a big bite and the bite I took was a rotten area. <laughs> you know, and but so the, the bad fruit, God turns on the light and says, don't eat that part, turn it around, eat the other part. And uh, he does that with us. He shows us these things so that we don't have to go through it again. Um, our response is to ask him to remove those strongholds so that his refining process can continue. Because the refining process is, is always leading to life and growth. Um, the, the pruning, I think John 15. Yeah, I have John 15 here. It says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it might bear more fruit. So the cycle of life is such that um, success is always met with pruning. You ever think about that? When you've been become uh, successful in something, there's always a cutting back. The Lord says, "Okay, this is good. There's fruit here, but He cuts back. He cuts back here. He cuts back over here because He doesn't want you to bear um, the wrong kind of fruit, and He doesn't want you to grow beyond your ability to to." to walk in what he's given you. Um, so success always meets with pruning, and that's just part of abiding. If you want to abide in the Lord, you've got to be able to say, yes, Lord, um, you can prune prune me, because the other option is he takes takes you and throws you into the fire. You know, The branches that don't bear fruit, he snips off and throws them in the fire. The branches that do bear fruit, he prunes. He prunes back. And the cycle of refining is like that. All of, all of creation is going through cycles, um, night and day, life and death, you know, the seasons, spring, summer, fall, winter. Everything is built to go through cycles and seed time and harvest, expansion, contraction. I mean, water evaporates and then it becomes rain again, right? Empires rise and fall. Economies boom and bust or, yeah, boom and bust. And there's all kinds of cycles that are built into our, our created world. And um, I want to take time to look at an example in the Word. This is uh, actually the exact same first verse we used last week. We talked about binding and loosing last week. This is the same verse for a totally different reason. But Peter is going to be our guide through this because Peter's great. I just love Peter. Um, he's like me. He opened his mouth before he knew what he was going to say. And then dealt with the consequences later, right? Okay, Matthew 16. Here we are again. Now, when Jesus came into the dis district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do you say that the Son of Man is? And they said to him, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter, of course, being the first one, spoke up and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth excuse me, shall be loosed in heaven. 
Then he strictly get, charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. So imagine being in that moment with Peter trying to be a good disciple, and he's like, oh, I know, I know, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Yeshua is obviously pleased, and he's like, the Father, should have, the Father spoke this to you, Peter. Can you imagine that Peter actually paid attention after that? He's like, wow, God spoke to me. You know what? I, I heard God's voice. He's the Son of God. And they're all like, yeah, we, we know. <laughs> and, but the, the, the moment, in that moment, must have been interesting because Peter would be the kind of person who would, who would and he said something about uh, a church and a rock and binding and losing or something. Did anybody write that down? And Matthew's like, yeah, yeah, I got it. Simon, because your head's full of rocks. So, so I think that I think that it's interesting that the the dynamic between the disciples. But Matthew wrote this down for us, and because uh, we saw it in the chosen, it's got to be true. So anyway, Peter's euphoric moment. He had this moment of being high on that revelation that he received, and he had no clue about the cycle of refining, but he's about to go through it. So let's see what happens, okay? In the next passage, verse 21. Uh, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day raised, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, you, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Whew. Imagine being in that room, although it was outside. Okay, Peter went from here to here in the blink of an eye. And, you know, um, anyway, Peter's like, where did that come from? I had it all figured out, you know. I knew all about the plan for, for you becoming king. But it had nothing to do with you dying. Where's this coming from, Lord? And he, he, he struck out with it with an emotional outburst of love for the Messiah. He said, no, this cannot happen. Because he was, he was, and this is where we see the stronghold. Peter believed a lie. He believed that if the Messiah died, all of God's plans would be ruined, destroyed. But he didn't know about the deeper purposes of God. He just knew what he was reacting to in the moment. Yeshua says, I'm going to die. And, and Peter's like, no, not on my watch. I'm in charge here, and you can't do that. And so the, the, whole, the, the whole dynamic is interesting, that, that Peter's rising up in his emotional response that any of us would do. Anybody who loved the Lord would have said, no, you, you can't do that. That's not going to happen. We're not going to let you. You know, um, what's his name? The zealot. Simon, yeah. He already probably already had his knife out. Well, no, that was thrown away. That's right. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, in Peter's defense, none of the disciples ever expected Yeshua to be killed. And, and even though he kept telling them over and over, this was not uh, in the first century Jewish thinking about the Messiah, did not include the Messiah dying. They could not comprehend it. Again, another stronghold. The stronghold that the Messiah would come, live forever, rule and reign, and they would all join him in, their, in the kingdom and live happily ever after. But that's not how it was to happen. So the strongholds of thought that Peter was dealing with, the Lord brought him through this cycle of refining where he, he learned that, okay, I believed wrong. Now I have to transform the way I think. And, and let's get, let's, let me clarify a little bit here because... Um, the get behind me Satan is literally this. It says, go behind me, adversary. Now, Peter was not possessed by Satan. Peter, Satan was probably nowhere to be seen. But he was acting as an adversary to God's purpose. Right? It wasn't that Satan himself had come and filled up Peter and made him say that. So the, um, it's interesting. Here in the Greek, it's, it's a little more clear. Um, the Greek word for adversary is satanas, satanas, which has been transliterated, because there's no real word for it in English, to Satan. Um, this causes the actual meaning of the word Satan to be lost. The term, advers the term means adversary. And it was borrowed from the Aramaic satana, which originally referred to one who laid an ambush 
as an adversary and then became used as a proper name meaning the adversary. The word Satan simply means adversary in all biblical languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. So Peter was not possessed by Satan in that moment for all of those people who are wondering. Just thought I'd clear that up. It's interesting how Peter's normal reaction uh, in his own desire to preserve the, the Yeshua's life was met um, by such a resistance from the Lord that because the, the Yeshua was responding to the soulish outburst that demonstrated a stronghold in, in Peter, and he dealt with it. Um, we find out a couple chapters later that Peter did repent, and he was restored completely because he was on top of the Mount of Transfiguration with the three who were enjoying the glory of God. But that's another story for another time. So that's the tension between the soul and the spirit. There's that purifying and refining process in which the Son of God, the Spirit of God, I'm sorry, reveals and removes a layer of something that cannot proceed further in God's purpose. If you want to continue in God's purpose, and I believe this is why this word is important for this church or anybody who seeks to walk in the purpose of God, you have to be flexible and willing to let the Spirit of God pinpoint something in your life that is bringing you through the those the cycles of the destructive cycles you're in because once you find that stronghold and you allow the holy spirit to remove it it's very simple you just pray spirit of god there's something in me that i know it's not demonic but i know it's not you so lord take that from me and remove that stronghold from my soul and he will. It happens in the blink of an eye. And then you realize you're not looking at things the way you used to look before. Your mind is being renewed and you're being transformed. And that relationship you have with the Lord is, is making it higher to a higher level. Um, you might think you're going in circles, this refinement cycle. I, I was kind of wondering about it and the Lord showed me. Um, I was looking at it from above and I see a circle. I keep hitting the same thing over and over. He says, it's more like an upward spiral. You're ascending a little bit each time. You come around, you encounter it, boom, you stop dead. A little higher, you just barely hit it, then ne next time around you miss it completely. So those things that used to harass you and those strongholds that used to keep you from your relationship with the Lord become something that you don't even think about anymore. You change the way you think about things and you've transformed your, your life by the renewing of your mind. All right, in closing, um, there are things you cannot bring into the presence of God, and God stirs up the soulish strongholds in our lives to expose those hidden things that oppose God's purpose in you. God will never give you something that opposes His purpose in you. And that's oftentimes why some of our prayers are not answered, because He doesn't want to give you something that opposes His purpose for you. Amen? All right. Christianity 101. Um, he does this not so you'll become uh, discouraged, but so that you'll focus on the refining. You'll refocus yourself on what God's refining. You may be deterred because you see it as success and then failure, and then success and then failure, or, or one step forward, two steps back. But you're, if your heart is toward God, you'll, you'll see his greater purpose in it. You'll see his kindness. You'll see his goodness in it. You won't be um, tormented by the fact that, that perhaps God hates me, right? Okay, that's a stronghold. That's one of those strongholds. God's not going to heal me. That's another one. You know, I'm not as good as I should be. Uh, all these things that you think, the self-talk, are strongholds that he wants to eradicate from your vocabulary and cleanse and purge from your thinking. And so as we allow him to bring us through that cycle, it gets easier and easier not to think the way you used to think. Does that make sense? Good. All right. Um, Amen. He's calling us to press in and pursue him. He does not hide things from us. He hides things for us, which I think is neat. You know, it's, it's the glory of kings to search out a matter because it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. God loves to play hide and seek. You ever, I mean, you ever play hide and seek as a kid? God loves to do that. You, you know, you go running by and you go running by and he sticks his foot out. And so you see his foot. Ah, there you are. I found you. So God loves to play hide-and-seek with his people, and, but he's not hiding from us. He's hiding things for us because he desires to give us 
as much as we can take in, as much as we pursue him, he'll respond. Hallelujah. Okay, I'm about done, but I want to share a couple things. Um, see, the revelation that we seek is like a two-sided coin. You have one side is this, is this shiny, pretty revelation that God gives us. But the other side is the process he wants to take us through to get to that revelation. And when we embrace both, you know, if, if, in, in prophesying, we used, to, we used to hear prophetic words, oh, you're a great general in God's kingdom, you're going to do mighty things for God, win mighty battles. And, and the, the part that we don't hear is that you're going to be in many battles, you're going to have to go up through the ranks, you're going to be put through hell before you can get into the place God has for you. But the prophetic sees far off, and that's the blessing. In the, but the other side of the coin is that the Holy Spirit's going to bring you through the things you need to deal with so that you can inherit that blessing he has for you. Because most of, our, most of the revelations don't show the process that we've got to go through, right? And I think that most of us already know this. I'm not preaching a lot of new stuff, but I think that it's important to realize that God's purpose is such in us that he says, I want to move you into these things for you, but you're not able to contain it, or you're not able to understand it, or you're not able to grasp it fully. So we go through some things where he refines us a little more, a little more, and all the dross comes to the surface, and he skims it off, and then he heats the fire a little more, and all the waste comes to the surface, and he skims it off, and he purifies that gold that's in us. So I think that's about the end of my message. For now, we'll start up again next week with a little more. But next week, we're going to talk more about walking into, fully walking into that redemption, fully walking into that, that um, the point where you're not having to go through that cycle of refinement over and over as he gets rid of the junk. So leave your baggage at the door and uh, let, him, let him decide what he wants to keep. But, um, well, let's pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for your refining in us you have an image in our in your mind of what we look like and we look just like yeshua we look just like yeshua and lord we ask that you would give us grace to endure that process of refining that deliverance from those things that hinder us Give us wisdom and integrity and, and understanding and discernment to know which strongholds you're highlighting, which things that we're getting offended at that we shouldn't be getting offended at because you want to bring healing to that area, which destructive cycle you want to break. Father, we thank you for, for bringing us into the place of liberty where the Spirit of the Lord is. There is freedom. We thank you, Father, that you have made us to walk in your glory that in our fallen state we fall short of your glory but as your children we are seated with you in the heavenlies we're designed for greater things we're destined to do the things that you did as you make us more like yeshua father continue this in us and give us the grace to stay in the process not to jump out of the fire, but to stay in that process and endure because you're bringing something that's wonderful, something that's greater than we could ever imagine. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy in the middle of all this. We give you honor and glory in the mighty name of Yeshua. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. If you need help with something, you need somebody to pray with you, uh, we'll be up here. And uh, you want us to agree with you to tear down a stronghold, let us know. We'll pray with you. But next week, we're going to get into some more on, the, uh, on the, uh, the resolution of strongholds. I'm not sure what to call that one, but that's part two. Anyway, so Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and show you his peace. In Yeshua's name. Shalom. 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 Shalom.